Good morning. So you need to make up the lab. Well, if you were present for the lab, uh, you'll need to do this first half of what I'm showing you. And if you were absent for the lab, you'll also need to do the second half. Um, before you do either of those, you need to make sure that you have your data table filled in. Um, if you don't have a hard copy of the data table at home, you can recreate this, um, but you need to have listed the different predictions and the different results. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of these are one of two choices. They either say NR, and what that means is when we put those two solutions together, nothing happened, we had no reaction, or you'll see a color and a PPT. Um, PPT means that when we mix those two solutions, the, cloud, the uh, combination became cloudy. And that cloudiness, in fact, that it's no longer perfectly clear, indicates that a solid was made from two of the ions that you combined. And we call that solid a precipitate, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, much like precipitation uh, in weather is something that falls from the sky, a precipitate in chemistry is something that falls out of solution. In other words, we've made a solid, it was kind of fine and powdery, but it'll sink to the bottom over time and we will see it as a discrete new compound. Um, you will notice that in my formulas, I have crossed out some um, items. Uh, on the left, I've crossed out the first element in the compound. That's because sodium and potassium are alkali metals and alkali metals typically are always soluble. So no matter what I put in a solution with sodium or potassium, I know it's not going to form a solid. Likewise, across the top, I've crossed out NO3, that's nitrate. Nitrates are also always soluble. And then I've crossed out the chlorides. Um, chlorides aren't always soluble, but in the pairings that we're using, they will be. Uh, chlorides are only insoluble. In other words, they only make a compound or precipitate with uh, lead, mercury, and silver. Uh, and you'll notice on the side, we have no lead, mercury, and silver on this side to combine it with. So this is the first step. So make sure you have this data table. If you don't have it, pause this video and copy it. So the next thing that we have to do is to write something called the net ionic reactions for every box that has a yes. Uh, even though this one had no reaction, we are gonna go ahead and write the net ionic. Notice all of these question marks and no's. See how this question mark had a precipitate? We're not gonna bother with anything there. The reason that we had a question mark here is because when you combine them, you don't get a predictable compound formed from the two ions. So we need to write, the, actually, this is the first question. According to the solubility tables, which, gen, which reactions should have generated precipitate? So that'll be box four, box five, box eight, and then boxes 10 through 17. So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. So the next question says, for each reaction that should have generated a precipitate, in other words, these 11, write the net ionic reaction in your lab book and balance it. Now, in this situation, it is okay to do this on paper uh, because you may or may not have your lab book or your sheet at home. Uh, I would recommend like not using the whole page so that you could possibly tape it in or glue it in. So I am going to be looking, let me scoot this up. I'm gonna be looking at boxes. Four five, eight, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Please uh, do fill these in in order. Like don't, I mean, balance these in order. Uh, it is challenging to grade these and if they're out of order, my brain explodes and you don't wanna be responsible for that. It's very ugly and the janitors don't appreciate the cleanup. So, um, this is how you are going to do this part. 
So if you look on box four, you'll see that what I combined, if you ignore the, chlor the chloride and the sodium, what I combined was calcium and sulfate. So the first thing I'm gonna do is write down the calcium and the SO4 with a little space. The second thing I'm going to do is find their charges using my ion sheet. Um, you can also look up these ions as well uh, online if you don't happen to have your ion sheet with you. So if I look on here, calcium has a charge of plus two and SO4 is down here. It has a charge of negative two. Why does that matter? Well, we have to consider the charges because ultimately we're gonna put these together to make a compound. That's our actual uh, precipitate that should have formed there. Two other things we're adding is the state of matter. For example, uh, these were dissolved in solution. And the way we represent that is by putting a little AQ after the ion. So these were added together and they made a precipitate. Now, this is an ionic compound. And remember the rule for ionic compounds is that their charges must add up to zero. So this one kind of makes us happy. Why? Well, plus two and minus two, I just can put them straight together and their charges will add up to zero. Now, this fell out of solution as a precipitate or technically it should have. I think maybe our concentration just wasn't high enough in the lab. So what we're gonna do for each of these on the right is follow it by a PPT. That means it formed a precipitate and fell out of solution. So just to recap, I got the ion and the ion. I figured out their charges. I put a little AQ after them to indicate they were in solution. And then I predicted the compound they would form. Number four is done. I'm gonna do a couple more with you, but then you will be doing these yourself. So let's look at box five. So in box five, what am I putting together? Well, I have the silver at the top. I have CO3 to the right, left, excuse me. Once again, I need to figure out their charges. So let's look at this sheet. If you look on the top, you see that silver is plus one. And if you look at CO3 on the bottom, you'll find out that it is minus two. I'm gonna add my little AQs to indicate that they're aqueous or dissolved in water. And now I need to predict the compound that forms again. So remember that the charges have to add up to zero. So in this case, I'm going to need Let's see, how many, what can I add to negative two to end up at zero plus two? So if I multiply my silver by two, that'll be plus two. And then I can add that to the minus two to end up with no charge. So two plus ones is plus two. That's why I just put the two there to indicate that. I can add that to negative two to end up, up at zero. So here's the last thing that we have to do on this one that we did not have to do on the reaction from number four. Notice that I had to add a subscript over here to say that I had two silvers. So the way that I want to make my equation balanced now is to come back and put a two in front of the silver to indicate that I had to have two silvers to make this compound. So now, as you can see on the right, I have one CO3 and on the left, I have one CO3. On the right, I have two silvers and on the left, I have two silvers. Okay, we're gonna skip down to box 11. So let's look, I wanna do one more example with you. Let's look at box 11. In box 11, uh, I do wanna point out that the iron we're using is Fe3 plus. So you won't have to look that one up. And then what is it combining with? OH. So let's find hydro OH on the bottom. 
if you look, here's OH, same as hydroxide, its charge is negative one. Once again, these are dissolved in water, so we're gonna put a little AQ. So uh, this time, I also still need to get my ions to balance. So what can I add to plus three to end up at zero? Well, I need this one to equal negative one. So how many of those will I need to make that happen? Well, three times negative one is negative three, which I could then add to positive three to end up with no charge on my compound, which is the rule for ionic compounds. So I'm going to write, I would like to point out, notice which ion always goes first is the positive one. We did do that in our naming compounds work. I just wanted to remind you of that. So because I need three OHs, I'll put the OH in parentheses and put the three outside. And then once again, this is a precipitate. So last thing to finish this one, I had to use how many OHs? Three. So I'm going to acknowledge that by putting a three in front of my hydroxide. Uh, by the way, if you accidentally mess up putting the coefficients on this side, that's gonna be a very minor, uh, if any, point deduction. The most important part is that you get the correct formula over here to balance the charges. And we've been doing that for a few weeks now, so hopefully that won't be too foreign. So that is the first thing you have to do uh, to finish the lab. So if you were here when we mixed the labs together, mixed the solutions together and filled out the data table, you are going to balance these 11 equations using the table. These are the net ionics. And then the last thing you're going to do is respond to this question. It says, write a conclusion that addresses the experimental question completely based on your observations. Well, let's look up here at the experimental question. The experimental question says, how does the solubility table help us to predict the products of double displacement reactions? Well, you may or may not remember that uh, prior to going in lab, we used this handy table to predict if a precipitate would form. If we got a combination of an S, we said no, no precipitate, because that means soluble. If we got an I, we said, yes, we expect a precipitate to form because I means it forms an insoluble product. If we got a line or an SI or a D, we put question mark because we weren't sure what would happen and we tested it in lab. So when we're responding to that experimental question, we can say the solubility table helped us to predict when precipitates would form. That's what all these yeses were. And then you wanna go back and look, was every, did every yes give us a precipitate? So here's a yes, we got a precipitate. For the most part, all of our yeses gave us a precipitate, but we had one exception. So how good was the solubility table for helping us to predict if we were going to have precipitates or products in general, well, it was pretty accurate, except we had one that didn't form a precipitate that we expected. So you want to say something along those lines in your own words, addressing that experimental question, which is right up there, just in case you want to pause this so that you can see the question. Okay, some of you were not here for the lab. If you were here for the lab and all you're doing is the write-up, you're done and you can end this video. For those of you who are absent, you have one last step to compensate for not being here for the lab. And that is you are going to write net ionic reactions for these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight equations. How do you do that? Well, hopefully you were here when we predicted products, but if not, you are going to use this solubility table. We'll zoom out a little so it all fits. Sorry, it takes a second to kind of get it 
just right. So you are gonna use this solubility table and I'm gonna put it here so that if you need to go back and pause, you can, or you may have it, or you can look one up. There's all kinds of solubility tables online as well. And you are going to use the solubility table to predict if we're gonna make a precipitate with the combinations here. And if we do make a precipitate, you have to write the net ionic reaction. So I'm gonna do two for you to show you the process and then you will have to do the rest. First of all, I would recommend that you go through and cross out the NAs, the CLs, the Ks, and the NO3s. Why? Those are soluble. So for example, in the first ones, I would cross out this CL3 and this Na2. I'm just gonna ignore them. They're not gonna be part of my uh, product. And then on the second one, I'm gonna cross out the NO3 and the Na. Why am I doing that? Well, that will help me focus on the ions that I want to combine to see if they make a precipitate. So on this first one, do you see how what we have left is Al and O? So I'm going to find where Al and O match. So here's Al and then here's oxygen. So where they match is right here. And you'll see that what I get is I. So I expect a precipitate to form. So you can write a net ionic reaction. If you get any lines or S's, just put NR on that box. I can't remember if any do that. One other thing that's handy about this table is it shows us the charges. So I know that I'm gonna have aluminum that's plus three and oxide that's two minus. So here's gonna be my net ionic reaction. Aluminum is plus three and it's dissolved in water aqueous. The oxygen is minus two, it's dissolved in water and it's aqueous. And then what precipitate should it make? Well, I can't just change one of these, but my least common multiple is six. So what would I have to multiply aluminum by to get to plus six? Two. So two aluminums, that's plus six. And what would I have to multiply oxygen by to get to negative six? Well, negative two times three is negative six, so I need three oxygens. And then that will be my precipitate. Now, the last thing that uh, I'd like you to try, at least attempt is to balance it. Notice that I've got one aluminum here, but two. So if I put a two in front of this aluminum, now have two aluminums on this side and two on this side. What will I have to put in front of the three, uh, the oxygen, sorry, a three. So now I show two aluminums and three oxygens coming together to make aluminum oxide. So this is the last one I'm gonna do for you. And then you'll have to do the other six independently. Notice on this one that I'm going to pay attention to lead and OH. Now, first of all, if you look at this, you'll notice that there's two versions of lead. Lead two, which is plus two, and lead four, which is plus four. So how do I know which one I have? Well, if you look at the NO3, what is NO3's charge? You can see right here that NO3 is minus one. So if I have two NO3s, that means that this part is gonna be minus two. So which lead does this have to be? This has to be the plus two lead because remember they come up with no net charge. So I'm gonna look at lead two, which is plus two, and I'm gonna combine it with OH. So let me get this set up so you can see what I'm looking at. So here is lead two, and I'm gonna come over to OH. So see, I came up from OH and over to lead two. And once again, I get an insoluble compound. So this tells me that OH is negative one. And of course, I already know that lead is plus two. So Pb2 plus, and this is aqueous, 
and OH1 minus, which is also still dissolved in water, aqueous. And this time I only need to add a coefficient to one of them. My OH is negative one. So if I multiply that by two, that'll be negative two, which would add to positive two to end up at neutral. So remember that in order to have more than one of an ion that's polyatomic, we have to put it in parentheses and put the number outside. And once again, this formed a precipitate. So the last thing you need to do is to bring this two. I have two OHs, so if I put a two in front of this, I'm now balanced. So you're going to attempt the rest on your own. I have given you these two, so copy them into uh, this. And uh, good luck. Uh, I know that we're out, so that makes it a little more complicated to get these things made up, uh, but do your best and I can take this when you get it to me. Uh, I hope you have a great day.